Listen, we're very thankful to have Dr. Bradley Trick for another discussion of the significant, in his significant series. And it's an examination of Jesus last week. And we'd like to once again recognize uh, the Roberts Teaching Fund for providing the funds for this. And um, have, uh, we'd like to thank you and Annette for, for for providing these funds for us to have this wonderful series. Um, Brad, are you with us? Don't scare me, Brad. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. I was afraid Tony was gonna have to teach. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Bradley Trick. Yes. Uh, so past few weeks, we've been looking at uh, Jesus's last week. Uh, the first week we looked at Mark and kind of the importance of preparation and, and getting ready, even when you don't uh, see the signs yet, because once it goes up, it's too late to start preparing. Uh, then we looked at um, the parables in Matthew 21 uh, and the importance of the wedding banquet and, and being willing to embrace those who um, are different, who, who see different aspects of, of God and, and be able to bring it together so we can get the full picture together. Uh, and we also talked about the Jesus's willingness to heal the blind and the lame if they are willing to come to him for healing, which unfortunately many of them were not. Last week, we looked at uh, the portrayal of Jesus's death in um, Mark and Luke and compared the differences and saw that they presented somewhat different pictures of Jesus's death. And, and so we talked about that. And then today, uh, appropriately, we're going to talk about the importance of resurrection. Why does it matter? That Jesus was resurrected. Uh, and, and part of this question, we're going to approach it through Hebrews. Um, and so let me, let me just read uh, Hebrews 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have, be I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And to the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds uh, or spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all become old as a garment, and as a mantle, you will roll them up. As a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? All right, so let's, uh, let's just pray here at the beginning. Jesus, we thank you that you came to earth, you became one of us, uh, and we thank you for all that you have done for us. We just ask that you would bless the reading of your word, and that you would continue to open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, uh, and transform us more and more into your image, that we might show you more perfectly to the world around us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, so here we have a contrast. Uh, throughout this first chapter, the, the author, uh, and we don't know who wrote Hebrews, it was traditionally ascribed to Paul. Uh, most scholars today doubt that very seriously because the, the language is very different than what we find in Paul. Um, and it doesn't claim to be written by Paul. Uh, so, you know, there, there are several different guesses. Uh, some have suggested uh, Apollos some Luke, um, 
one scholar even suggested it was Priscilla. Um, so that seems unlikely because when it does uh, use um, participles, it, it uses the masculine form. Um, but in this first chapter, uh, the author is, is making a contrast between Jesus, who's the son, and the angels. Okay. Uh, and if we look at verses 1, 7 to 8 in particular, it says, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And that word winds could also be translated spirits. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Now, that comparison seems a little odd. What, what's actually being compared here? And what is the basis of the comparison? Well, Christ is superior to the angels in three ways. First of all, the relationship. The fathers declare Jesus to be his unique son. Uh, his reign will be righteous and will be eternal. And... Uh, then the, the reference to the footstool, he's promised to make Jesus um, superior, even using what, the angels or his enemies, not, not enemies, uh, as his footstool. Those three ways. Okay, good, good. Um, and so, yeah, he, he says, uh, you know, you sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Um, and he, he also uh, talks about um, uh, he's inherited a, a more excellent name than they. Um, and, and the name there seems to be uh, Lord, which, you know, is the name for God uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. <clears throat> um, or, or Yahweh. Um, what is the specific contrast in seven and eight or seven, seven to nine? In the fact that Christ is unique is unique, there's only one. But what, what differentiates him from the angels? It's humanity. His humanity. Uh, and, and how do we see this? Well, he starts out and contrasts um, the angels. And he says the angels are what? They're spirit and fire. Yeah. Okay. Angels are spirits and fire. What are humans? Flesh and blood. Humans are flesh and blood. Okay. So he says, uh, you know, angels, he makes spirits and fire. And then we would expect the contrast to be, but Jesus is what? Flesh and blood, but he doesn't say that. How, what is the contrast he makes with verse 8 or, or in verse 8? But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Mm -hmm. So the contrast seems to be uh, angels are spirit and fire, but the Son has a throne. Mm -hmm. Well, how do those things, I mean, it seems like apples and oranges. Yeah. Well, I'm spirit and fire. Well, I have a throne. Oh, well, you know, those things can't go together. Why? Well, it, it has to do with um, who's allowed to sit on the throne. Okay. Um, and if we, if we skip over to uh, verses or chapter two, um, in verses five to eight, it says this. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, uh, and here we're going to quote from Psalm 8, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. 
For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Okay. Uh, and so what is this saying? Humans uh, or, or man or the son of man, uh, and son of man here is just another way of, of saying uh, a human, right? Um, though it could also have the other connotation of, of the son of man, meaning Jesus. Uh, but this psalm says that humans have been made lower than the angels for a while. And that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in now. Who, who, who um, controls this world or who's in charge in this world? It's the angels, right? They, they have uh, precedence over humanity in, in this world. But he says in the world to come, who's going to be in charge? That would be Christ. And mm, although not necessarily. Became, wouldn't Christ be when he's on earth? would be lower than the angels, but it would be reversed in heaven. Uh, except this is talking about uh, humanity. Okay. Uh, right? What, what is man? What is, what is humanity? Uh, what are humans that you remember them? Right? And, and in Jewish uh, culture, this, this psalm, this, this bit about, you know, what is man that you remember him and son of man that you're concerned about him? This was traditionally applied to, to two figures in the Old Testament. One of whom was Adam. Right. And the other was Moses. Okay. Um, and, and with regard to Adam, what happens is God places Adam and Adam and Eve in, in the garden. And then what does he command all the angels to do? Uh, we see a reference to this in, in 1 6. It says, When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Mm. Okay, and so he creates uh, humanity and then tells the angels to what? Worship humans. Mm. Now, why, why should angels worship us? The humans are, uh, bears God's image. Yeah, because we bear the image of God. That is why we, we are worthy of being worshipped by it, not, not because of any intrinsic worth that we have, but because we bear God's image, right? Uh, or that, that is the intrinsic worth that we bear. Um, but in, in Jewish lore, there, there is one angel that says, uh, no, I'm spirit and fire. That thing over there is, what did God make us out of? You know, dirt of the ground, right? That's dirt. I'm not going to worship dirt. I'm not going to yeah. stoop to that. Yeah. Um, and, and so that angel gets, gets kicked out. We, we know that angel better is, you know, Satan. Uh, he refuses to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so what this is talking about in, in Psalm 8 and, and here in chapter 2 is there's going to come a point in time where things shift. Because God has declared that the world to come, humanity is going to be in charge. We're, we're going to have the upper hand. This is why Paul says, you know, you're going to be judging angels. Can you not solve this little matter among yourselves, you know, to the Corinthians? Uh, so in this world, we're under the rule of the angels. We're subject to them. But in the world to come, it gets flip-flopped. Okay? So... What is it that qualifies Jesus to sit on the throne? And note, uh, again, in, in 113, um, you know, we had this contrast with angels. Uh, you have angels who are spirits and fire, but to the son, he says what? Sit at my right hand. Right? Why is it that Jesus gets to sit on the throne? His, his humanity. Yeah, it's because he's human. It's not because he's divine. It's not because he's God. It's, it's, I mean, the, the angels are also divine. They're, they are spirit and fire. And that's why, you know, there was a group of them that didn't want to stoop to worshiping humanity. Why does Jesus become human?
because humanity is destined to sit on the throne in the world to come. Mm-hmm. He becomes human so that he can share in our destiny and actually enable our destiny. But it's because he's human, not because he's God, that he's invited to sit on the throne. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Which means, you know, in in a sense, there's no uh, greater calling than being created human. Because we have been created to uh, and invited to sit on the throne. Okay, and, and Jesus comes so that he can share in that destiny and also so that he can enable that destiny because we kind of screwed things up. All right, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about um, atonement for a minute. What is, what is atonement? Making things right. Making things right. Um, and, and how does Jesus make things right with God on our behalf? Dies on the cross. He dies on the cross. Is it his death that makes things right? Isn't it his sacrifice, his blood? Okay, good. Blood, blood is the key thing. Uh, Leviticus 17.11. Um, life is in the blood and the blood is what God has given us for making atonement. Okay. Um, so where does Jesus make atonement? Isn't it in heaven when he places his own blood before the throne or am I getting it back? No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's in heaven. Right. And if you've read the rest of Hebrews, you know, it's going to go on in contrast. You know, Jesus is a high priest with high priests here on earth who, who go into, you know, a, a humanly constructed temple. And, and that's imperfect. It can't really make anything perfect. But Jesus goes into the, the Holy of Holies in heaven. Right. Right. Um, which is interesting because it means that the cross is not what? The cross is not final, it's not the end. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, you know, if you look at Romans uh, 4.25, what does Paul say? Um, Jesus, our Lord, uh, who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So he associates crucifixion with our transgressions. You know, our transgressions mean that that he had to die. But our justification, he associates with his resurrection. Right? Um, And and again, if you flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1517. Paul says this, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are dead or you are still in your sins. Right now, think about that for a minute, because often our view of atonement is we needed somebody to take the punishment, right? We, we send someone needed to die. Uh, Well, if that was the issue, then his death would have been enough. Right? His death should have cleared the slate. It should have, you know, whether or not he is raised, then then we should be good. Right? Because someone has died. Blood has been spilled. But according to Paul, if he's not raised, if he wasn't resurrected, then we're still in our sins. His death hasn't done anything for us. That's kind of curious, isn't it? Yeah. So why is that? Well, as Vic said, where does he make atonement? It's not on the cross. It's It's in heaven. In heaven. It's in heaven. On the altar. 
on the altar in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's an issue there. Mm -hmm. Because human blood and flesh can't enter into the heavenly realm because that's the realm of spirit and fire. Right? Because what would happen? We, We would just get burned up. Right? We, we can't be sustained in the heavenly realms. That's why Paul in, in 2 Corinthians, when we talk about, I know somebody that was caught up into heaven, uh, into the third heaven. Uh, and he says, whether it was in body or not, I don't know. In other words, I, I know that's an issue. I'm not going to get into that. Because Jews recognize, and this was something they wrestled with. You know, How can humans go into heaven? Because that's not a realm that, that we um, are fit to be in. Okay, our constitute why? Because our flesh is now mortal. Yeah. Right? Our our flesh is is uh, and, and what does mortal mean? It means susceptible to death. Right? right? <clears throat> so here's the question: how can Jesus go into heaven and make atonement if he's human, if he has human mortal flesh? Because once Christ dies, he becomes, in effect, the sacrificial lamb. Remember, sacrifices were part of the temple worship. And it would seem like to me that it's the blood of Christ that goes to heaven. How does he get there? It's an act of God. He's okay. raised from the dead. Uh, flip over to Hebrews 5 for a minute. Uh, look at verses 8 to 10. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But he was perfect. He was sinless. But here it says he had to be made perfect. So what does that mean? Because you're right. We traditionally hold that Jesus was, was perfect. He was sinless. He didn't sin. So what does it mean he had to be made perfect? He was. It says he had to suffer, and through the suffering, he learned obedience. And then once he'd been made perfect. Are you, are you saying through temptation? No. Nope. Became... Well, he, he was part human, part divine. Okay. So what about that was imperfect? Had to die. He, comes, he comes and shares in our human situation, which means he takes on what? Flesh and bone. Human form. Flesh and bone, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what's the problem with our flesh right now? It's mortal. Mortal, right. It can't go into the heavenly realms. Right? He, he, once he's made human, he can't just walk back into the temple in heaven and say, hey, here I am, guys. Because his human form would just be burned up. Burned up. Wow. He had to die. Why does he have to die? Well, because his his human form is subject to death. But what happens after his death? He's resurrected. And what is his resurrected body like? Perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. It is clothed in glory. Right. And, and if you read um, the account of Moses, um, because in Jewish in Jewish uh, thought, Moses was taken into heaven to receive the Torah. Um, and if you read that that excerpt from the um, Babylonian Talmud, which uh, is, is kind of confusing. So if, if you didn't, that's fine. Um, but what you see in that excerpt is uh, Jewish speculation. Moses goes into heaven and all the angels again are kind of like, what is this human person doing here? And they're all kind of antagonistic and, and, and uh, 
God tells Moses, well, give them an answer. He says, well, what am I supposed to do? And, and God says, grab my throne. And so he does, and, and God covers him with his glory. And once he's covered with God's glory, things change like that. And the angels all start coming up and whispering their secrets to him. And, and uh, you know, all that. what happens when Adam and Eve partake of the fruit? They lose God's glory and dominion. Yeah, they lose God's glory. Right. John tells us that in, in the beginning, uh, you know, God's life was was in humanity and and his life was the light of humanity. They were clothed in glory. That's that's why uh, they don't realize they're naked until they eat, because they are clothed in glory. They are clothed in light. Right. But they, they partake, they sin and, and death enters in and the light goes away and suddenly they realize Woo, we're naked. Right. Just like Moses, when Moses goes into God's presence, when he comes back, what's happened to his face? Illuminated. Yeah, it glows. It glows. It, 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 it shines with God's glory. It's that glory that protects us in the heavenly realms. And it's because our flesh is now mortal, we're not clothed in that glory that we can't enter in. Jesus had the same problem. He took on our humanity so that he could share in our destiny, but once he becomes human, he can't enter back into the heavenly realms. So he has to die and then be resurrected. And then once he is resurrected, then he can take his, his new glorified body, which can't die, and he goes into heaven. And that's the point at which he makes his offering. Right. And what does he offer himself, his body in one point, uh, his blood, according to Hebrews? Uh, he says, here I am. And what does God say to him? Right. Sit at my right hand. Where is he inviting Jesus to sit? What is God's throne? Well, first of all, where is God's throne? If you think about the temple in the Old Testament, where was the throne? The Holy of Holies. The throne. It was back in the Holy of Holies, right? You have the outer temple, and then you have the inner temple that only the priest could go into, and then you have the Holy of Holies, which was the little box in the, in the very center that, that only the high priest would go into only you know one day a year on the Day of Atonement. Well, what was in that holy of holies? Well, that's where the, the ark was and, and the seat. There's a seat there. You know what the name of the seat is? Mercy seat. The mercy seat. It's the mercy seat. And that's where the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle the blood. Right? That, that seat represents God's throne in heaven. And remember, the earthly temple is a copy of, of the one in heaven. So when the Father invites Jesus to sit at his right hand, where is he inviting him to sit? On the mercy seat. Hmm. And so he is sitting there with, with his family on the mercy seat, always there ready to intercede on our behalf in the heavenly realms. Right? And he can do that in the heavenly realms because in the heavenly realms, he's what? He's a priest. Is he a priest on earth? He's not. Who are the priests on earth? Hebrews 8.4. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. Uh, and, and as he goes on to say, uh, you know, priests on earth under the law were from the tribe of, of um, Levi. Levi. Jesus is from what tribe? Judah. Judah. Uh, and as the author of Hebrews says, the, the law doesn't say anything about the people of Judah being priests. So, so Jesus is not a priest on earth. 
He couldn't make an offering on earth. Right? He has to go into the heavenly realms, and there, once he goes into the heavenly realms, he is appointed a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now, do you remember who Melchizedek was? He's he the one that met guy... Abraham. Yeah, yeah, he was the guy in the Old Testament that uh, Abraham encounters and, and um, you know, ends up blessing, and, and you know, Abraham gives him some spoils. Uh, well, what is Melchizedek? Melchizedek is an angel. That's why in, in Hebrews 7, uh, it goes through talking about um, Melchizedek, and, and it says, uh, you know, 7.3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest per, uh, perpetually. Well, not having mother, father, having no end of your days or beginning of your days, uh, that's not human. Uh, so Melchizedek, and, and this was understood in, in Jewish uh, thought, Melchizedek is an angel. And that's why when Jesus goes into heaven, he becomes the high priest of the order that's named after Melchizedek. That's kind of odd too, right? Uh, it's named after Melchizedek, and yet Jesus becomes the high priest. Why? Because in the world to come, who's on top? Humans. Humans, not angels. Right? So Jesus is appointed a priest to order Melchizedek. Why? Because he now has an indestructible life. That's the qualification for, for becoming a, a um, member of the order of Melchizedek. So as a priest in heaven, he is now seated on the mercy seat with his blood, where, where he is uh, continually available to make intercession for us. Right? And this is why Paul says, if, if the resurrection didn't happen, we're still in our sins. This, by the way, is also why in John, at the end of John, you know, the resurrection accounts and, and Mary sees him and he says, what? Don't touch me. Right. right? Why does he not want to be touched? Because he hasn't yet been up there and, and high priests have very strict, uh, you know, requirements about, you know, becoming defiled and contaminated. And, and uh, you don't want to get defiled right before you go make your, your big offering he says i haven't been to my father yet i haven't been up there yet so don't touch me yet right so we uh if, if you flip over to hebrews 10 uh, verses 19 to 20 says since therefore brothers and sisters we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. Right? And, and what that makes it sound like is the veil is his flesh and, and somehow, it, but no, the new and living way is his flesh. Right? As, as we become united with him, we gain entry into the heavenly temple, right? If, if you think about Ephesians, Paul talks about our relationship with Christ in terms of a, a marriage, right? And in Revelation, the, the church is portrayed as the bride of Christ, right? Well, what happens when a husband and wife come together? They become what? One. They become one what? One flesh. What? Yeah. One flesh. What kind of flesh do we have? Mortal. Mortal. Subject to death. What kind of flesh does he have now? Immortal, incorruptible, permanently glorified. As we become more and more intimate with Jesus, with Christ, we become one flesh. But that transformation one way right we can't corrupt his flesh so as we become one flesh with him our flesh is being transformed until eventually paul tells us one day there will be a, a generation that walks so closely with him that uh their, their mortal flesh is just swallowed up like that and in an instant they will be transformed 
right? Does that make sense? Uh, and so this is what allows us access into the heavenly realms. This is why we can now enter into the heavenly realms. Through Jesus's flesh, through his glorified, resurrected flesh. Does that make sense? And, and do you have a better understanding now of, of why resurrection is so crucial and important? Yes. Yep. Um, it, it's not that, that, you know, somebody had to pay a penalty so that we could be let back, you know, out of the penalty box and, and get back on the ice. Um, it, it's that we have mortality in our flesh. We have sin and death locked into our flesh. And that means that we can't enter into that. We can't survive in the heavenly realms. Right. We have to be clothed with the glory. And that's what resurrection uh, enables. That's what enables us to enter into the heavenly realms. That's what enables us to come directly before the throne. His flesh, his resurrected flesh. Right, which again is also the key to overcoming sin in our own lives because his sin or his flesh is, is incorruptible. Uh, it doesn't have any mortality left in it. It is immortal. All right. So I will, I will leave it there um, and encourage you to, to think about that this week, um, the importance of his resurrection, uh, not only in general terms, but also for us personally. Um, you know, we, we now have access to the heavenly realms. Are you taking advantage of that? Do you take the opportunity to actually enter the, into the heavenly realms and, and you know, make your petitions known before God, because that's the advantage that we have over those who came before Jesus. They didn't have that kind of access. We do. Because of the resurrection. All right. So Christ is risen. He's risen. Christ, Christ, Christ is risen. Indeed. Indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thanks. Excellent, Brad. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Yeah. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed being with you these past few weeks. Thank you. We've enjoyed Thank you. having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you so much, Brad. It was great. <laughs> great series. Great lessons. Extremely thought provoking. Thank you, Hap. Good. Yeah, thank you, Hap. Yes, I appreciate yes. you making this possible. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Guys, are these tapes? This is Annette Roberts. Are these tapes somewhere? I've enjoyed yeah. them all. They are, Annette. Yes. Yeah. yes. We sent out every week. Great. <laughs> is this the time for the closing hymn? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can hum. <laughs> the time for our final prayer and uh don sayers is going to give our final prayer this morning don you with us hey don he's muted yeah he's muted <laughs> don's muted he's praying though <laughs> Don, you're muted. I think he just said amen. <laughs> hey, and run over to his house and tell him he's muted. <laughs> hey, Don, you're muted. I just under there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh oh, there we go. He, he muted it again. <laughs> now you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we hear you now. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, for his life, his death, 
and most importantly, his resurrection that gives our lives meaning, purpose, hope, and direction with your promise of eternal life. Today, we ask a special blessing from you on those affected by the virus pandemic. Give them and their loved ones strength to overcome its dreadful grasp. Please bless our class and keep them safe until we meet again next week. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.